Good morning. This is uh, Dash vir- or Virtual PPX Dash Admin Training. Excuse me. Uh, you should be seeing the Dash login page, and this is simply at dash dot virtual pbx dot com. If you're on the virtual pbx dot com website, if you mouse over support, uh, you should scroll down. You should see the Dash login link there as well. And logging in is just a matter of using your email address. Your password. And then the account name is typically your company name. Uh, You have the option to remember, so that way you don't have to keep typing everything in. And then you also forgot your info link to the right. All right, and then you get signed in and you get to the dashboard. Now, if you've just signed up uh, or this is your first time logging in to Dash, uh, it'll start you off with the the Dash wizard. Basically, shows you where some of your account information is, et cetera. Once you close out of that, then you'll be here on the dashboard page. Over on the left, you've got your Dash navigation. So this is where you're basically setting everything up for your phone system. And we'll be going through each of these categories. In the middle here, you've got your total users. So these are all the people on your account who are making and receiving calls. Uh, And these are, so on Dash, you're being charged per user, so each one of these people, or each, whenever you add someone, you're increasing your bill. If you remove someone, you're decreasing your bill. Uh, Down below that, we have got your devices, and these are broken down by type, so soft phone, cell phone, et cetera. And then unregistered just means these are devices, uh, generally VoIP phones, that the system is not detecting as connected, which means we can't send a a call to it nor can they make an outbound call from those devices. Over here to the right, oops. Let's go back to the dashboard here. Sorry about that. Uh, We have your main phone numbers. So these are the phone numbers that your customers are typically dialing to get to your system, right, to get to you and your staff. These numbers behave the same way. So they'll have the same main greeting playing, and they'll have the same routing. Down below that, we've got a fax box number. So this is so I can receive uh, inbound faxes on this account. Uh, You can also have another section here for a conference number. Uh, Basically, if you're ever going to host conferences, you would have another separate number for that. And we got total numbers. Uh, Assigned numbers, these are numbers that you're using, meaning they go someplace, right? They're a main number, or they go directly to a particular user or to a ring group, et cetera. Spare numbers, these are numbers on your account, but you're not using them right now. Basically, they're ringing busy. They're not going to any one or any person or department. Now, most Dash plans include between one and three phone numbers as part of your plan price. Uh, Once you exceed that, numbers are typically $4.99 per month per phone number. So on this account, I'm spending a lot of money on phone numbers. Down below that, I've got a, a breakdown of U.S. local numbers, U.S. DID, uh, and U.S. toll-free, basically saying what kind of numbers I have and whatnot. You could also have uh, us heading here for international phone numbers. If you're interested in non-U.S. phone numbers, you're going to want to email porting at virtualpbx.com and give them the city and country that you're looking for. Uh, Porting will let you know, A, if we can get numbers for that particular city and region, and if so, also what, if any, special uh, parameters we need, i.e., uh, like Germany, for, an, for instance, requires proof of presence, meaning you have to have uh, an office in this city that you're requesting a phone number in, and they're requesting proof of that, usually like a utility bill. But it varies from country to country. Some don't care. Others are very strict about the kinds of documentation they want before they release a phone number. 
All right, company director users. Notice that this is 11, even though my total users is 21. Uh, basically, when I chose to create several users, I chose not to include them in the user directory. I can always change that later. And then you have a download link to have all your users on one on the page. Next up, we've got the account ID. This is technically your account number. Uh, if you ever have to call in or uh, email in or chat for support or our sales team or our billing team, we don't typically ask you for the account number. We'll typically ask you for your company name, as that's usually easier for most people to rattle off, uh, and we can search for you by that. Uh, next up, we've got the account realm. Uh, this is used for a couple things. So if you're going to use a third-party VoIP device, meaning a VoIP phone that's not supported by your auto provisioning, or a soft phone application from, say, Counterpath, you would use the account realm as part of the setup process for those, for those devices. The other major thing that the account realm is used for is for uh, email to fax. So on Dash, you can create an email and in that email, we basically you send out a fax. So in the to field, it's plus one the area code and phone number of the fax number you're faxing to, the at symbol, and then your account realm. And then you simply attach a uh, PDF or TIFF file and send it off, and if your fax goes out. Also, for just being a Dash customer, you get a store discount code for use in our web store linked right up here. Uh, so you can use that to buy VoIP phones or uh, network equipment. And since we're up here, we'll go ahead and click on caller ID. So this is for your main numbers, and you can select either. This is, unfortunately, the pull down is not working properly on this particular browser. And then you've got the company caller ID name or C name. This is restricted to 15 characters, including spaces and special characters, uh, essentially an industry standard. Uh, once you click on Save Changes, this information gets sent to the various servers with the various carriers that support CNAME. It takes about three business days for all of them to get updated, and then once you make outbound calls, your, comp your company name will start showing up for that CNAME label. A couple of things to keep in mind about CNAME. First and foremost, not every carrier supports CNAME. So if your call happens to route through one of those carriers, your CNAME information will not show up at the destination. Uh, even for the carriers who do support CNAME, CNAME is not a priority. Right? Their first priority, connect the call. And then secondly, get the caller ID information to show up. Right? So if they're having heavier than expected call volume, CNAME is the first thing they drop. Right, so like uh, we got in the U.S., we've got election night coming up in a, in the next year. In certain regions, as they're doing their caucusing or their primaries, those areas are going to have heavier call volume. Don't expect your CNAME information to go through in that kind of scenario. And then obviously, if a carrier is having an outage or a you know a maintenance thing going on, again, that's probably not your CNAME information won't go through. All right, down below this, we've got the company emergency address, or E911. So this is for your VoIP phones, and this is the default address that will be sent if someone picks up your VoIP phone and dials 911. So you obviously want this to be the correct address. Now, if you have employees at different locations, you can set up the E911 for each device so it has the correct uh, location for them. And then you would click on Save Changes if you make any changes. Next up, we got Hold Music. So Hold Music on Dash, this is for after your inbound caller has already spoken to somebody, right? So a call comes in, it got to Mary. Mary's talking to the customer and then puts, presses Hold on her VoIP phone. This is the file that's going to play by default. Now, on Dash, you can upload your own Hold Music. Uh, Dash accepts .wav, .wav or .mp3 files up to one megabyte in size. Now, big thing to keep in mind when you're uploading files to a phone system, 
when you listen to it over the phone, you get one speaker. So you want to make sure that the file that you are uploading is recorded in mono, not in stereo. So like when you record on a computer, by default, it's going to put you in stereo because it assumes you're going to play it back on the computer, which is typically a stereo device. Phones don't have two speakers, typically speaking, to outplay audio. Uh, so if you try to put a stereo file up on the dash, it'll accept the file. It's not going to give you an error. But when you try to listen to it over the phone, you're either going to hear nothing, so it'll be a dead air essentially, or most likely you're going to hear a lot of static and you might hear parts of your greeting or hold music. But you would click upload here, find the file on your computer, and then click on this button right here, which is the little blue and white up arrow, and then click on save changes. And then we got the hours of operation which puts us under our main numbers heading. So by default, new accounts are on 24-hour open office, right? ready to accept calls. Or you can change it to custom office hours. So for each day of the week that you're open for business, i.e. you're taking calls in, put a check mark in front of that day, and then these boxes come available, and then you put your open hours in 24-hour or military time, and you just select from the drop down. And something that you may not see too easily, but right down here, you've got the option here to be if your whole office or facility is closed for lunch, put a check mark here for being closed for lunch hours, and then you can input your lunch hours. That way, when that time comes, the system automatically puts you in lunch mode. Okay, office holidays, you can set your holidays up in advance. First and foremost, up here, if you're closed for holidays, put a check mark. Otherwise, the system just assumes you're open all the time. Over here to the right, you click on Add Holiday, and you've got your choice of single day, date range, and advanced. Single day, pretty self-explanatory. We have the option here of President's Day. Give it a name, and then I select the date. Now. One thing to keep in mind, uh, this comes up every now and then, is after that holiday has passed, you can update the date right away. I tell people probably wait a couple days before they do that, so that way they don't accidentally put themselves in holiday mode on back-to-back -back days because there's no year indicator here at all. All right, date range. Pretty easy to understand. You give it a name, and then you select here's where it starts, here's where it ends, basically. Once the date rolls in, system puts you in holiday mode. Once the end date expires, puts you back in open mode. Now, because there's no no year indicator, you want to be careful about having a date range that covers New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. So what we recommend is for those particular days, just do single day. So one for New Year's Eve, one for New Year's Day. If you're going to be closed before or after that as well, you can do date ranges leading up to that time. All right, and then advanced, which is this example here. Basically, I set the second Monday of, Mar second Monday of March. We're closed, right? Company retreat, this is what we do. And the system will automatically put me there in holiday mode. And again, save changes. And now we get to the meat of it. Incoming call handling. So this is how your system is handling calls that come in on your main numbers. All right. You're going to have sub-tabs here. So I have for open hours and holiday hours. If I was closed for lunch, I'd have a lunch tab off, off over here, or tab over here, excuse me. Uh, and if I was, so I kept this one on 24-hour open office, but if I went with uh, the custom office hours, I would have an after hours tab as well to cover those times when we're not actually open. Then you've got these three options, right? First one, call comes in, goes to your virtual receptionist, and if you click on the virtual receptionist, there we go, gives you this field or this window. So on the left, these are your main menu, right? So this is what your customers dial or press on their phone to navigate through your phone system, right, to get to your people. Over on the right, we've got your greeting options.
So you can add a route, so you can use 0 through 9. And then here you've got where you're routing it to, right? So you can route it to a person, right, to an individual user. You can route it to a ring group, which is typically a department. Uh, you can route it to an ACD queue if you're making use of queues, which is a beefier or more has more routing options than a ring group, but still technically for a department. Uh, you can actually send it to a specific device if you want, so like a, a particular VoIP phone. Uh, not typically recommended just because if no one picks up, if that device doesn't have its own capability of accepting a message, the call just ends. Uh, you can actually send it to a media file, so you can have like a greeting play, but then once that greeting uh, stops playing, the call itself is ended. All right, over here you've got your greeting options. So you have text-to-speech, meaning you type in a greeting, you click on save here, or update rather, and then you click, you would click save, and then you would click save changes. So anytime you make a change to the virtual receptionist, you're clicking save twice, right? You're clicking save on the virtual receptionist window itself, and again, uh, uh, you're hitting clicking save changes on the uh, incoming call handling page. All right, you can also upload your own file, right? So dot wave, dot mp3, recorded at mono, under one megabyte, then it's good to go. If you already have greetings in place, right, you've uploaded several greetings, you can always go back and choose one that you want to do. So like, you know, you, you may have a special greeting for Thanksgiving. Well, once Thanksgiving ends, you can go back to your normal greeting, right? And then for Christmas, again, special greeting, Christmas is over or New Year's is over if you're going to be gone, like closed for the holidays. Then after the holidays, boom, back to normal. You can record it over the phone. Now this by default, the system assumes that you're you're going to do this from a VoIP phone that you have on the system, and it gives you a PIN number here. Now, that PIN number is specific to the time of day that you're in. So right now, I'm in my open hours. That PIN number is specific to my open hours, and only and I can only make the change. I can only record right now for my open hours, right? So right now, I'm in open. I can call in and I can make a new or greet, make a new greeting over the phone because I'm in open. Now, if I wanted to make a new holiday greeting, I had to put the system in holiday mode to make a call in to make a new greeting. All right, lastly, we have professional recording services. So we have partnered with another company called Snap Recordings. If you click the order button there, it'll take you right to their site. They have their own pricing. They have something like 100 voice actors to choose from, both male and female. They've got version, different versions of English, like UK English, Australian English, US English, different versions of Spanish and French. They can do bilingual greetings. They also have packages that include uh, hold music, uh, so you can have music and a script play, etc. And they typically will email you the file, and then you can upload it. And they also have like express options so they can get it to you quicker. All right. Now over here we've got the number of retries on missed dial. Basically, how many times can your inbound caller uh, have a wrong entry? Right. So they hit pitting four even though you don't have four listed as a menu option. And you can set that to like one or two or three or whatever. And then again, when you're done click save, and then make sure you click save changes here. All right, so next option. Call comes in. I'm having it go to Bob here. If Bob doesn't pick up, then it goes to my virtual receptionist. Likewise, I can change this to go to a ring group. I can have it go to a call queue. I can have it go to a specific device. But basically, it's giving a staff member a chance to answer the call first, if they're not able to pick up, then they go to the virtual receptionist. And again, it's the same options that you had or that we just saw on that previous page. And then this option here, call comes in. Again, you can send it to a person or group of people, right? So user, ring group, et cetera. 
Uh, if they're not able to pick up, then send it to a particular voicemail box. But no matter what, again, if you make any changes, click on Save Changes. Right here, we've got your main fax box and the number that's associated with it. If you click on here, you've got, you can unassign the number if you're going to decide, I don't want to deal with faxes anymore. And then you have an option here to edit the fax box. Now, unfortunately on this, it's a test system and it doesn't work properly, but on yours, uh, you'll have a window pop up and you'll have two fields. One is for the inbound notification. Basically, you put your email address or the email address of who you ever want to handle your incoming faxes. So they'll get the faxes as a PDF file. And then they have another field for uh, permissions, basically for outbound faxing. So if you have your own company domain, right, so you have abcdogwalking.com, you can put in that second field at abcdogwalking.com. Anyone with that email address, right, so anyone on that email domain can then send a fax out through our system without actually having to be a user on the account. Right, so you have like an intern who's helping out over the holidays. You say, hey, you've got an email address on the on the on our domain. I need you to send faxes out to these numbers, and then here's how to do it. They can just send an email, but you don't have to add them as a user, so you don't have to increase your bill. All right, numbers. These basically show your numbers on the account and where they're going. Over here, we have spare numbers. So these are numbers, again, we're not using for whatever reasons. If you buy a number, right, you have an option for local or toll-free. Now, if you just signed up and you don't happen to have any phone numbers on your account, uh, by buying a number, all you're doing is adding it to your account. You're not going to be charged for anything until you go over your phone number allotment for your plan. But here, so I chose a local number, so I just need an area code. And we will go with, try 650, do a search, oh, it looks like nothing was available. Well, let's go to toll free. That's a little strange. We might be having an issue. So what should happen is you should see a list of numbers here, and you click on buy, and you can buy, buy multiple at once, or add, sorry, excuse me, it says add, and then you click buy numbers and you add them all to your account. Gonna have to let our DevOps team know what's going on with that. Uh, you also have the option here to port a number, which is basically just move a number from another carrier to Virtual PBX, right? So from AT&T to Virtual PBX, and you would just click on new port request and it'll give you the steps to walk through it. Basically what we need is a filled out letter of agency, a LOA. Um, there's, you can download that through the port process or from the virtualpbx.com website. Uh, if you're porting a local phone number, so non toll free, then we also need a recent copy of your bill. You can upload both of those through that, the, this port process that you start up here or you can just email them to porting at virtualpbx.com and we'll go ahead and get that port process started. All right, let's go over to users. So these are all the users on your account. So these are people who are making and receiving calls. You can click on add user. Pretty straightforward. Give them, you know, put in their name. Uh, each user should have their own unique email address. Uh, and then you create a password. The main and most important thing you want to check here is right there, is make sure to send them their credentials, so that way they know how to log in. Uh, and then here's your option for including the user directory. Now, on this account, I started off the first extension as extension 1000, so the system is defaulting me to the next available extension that starts with 1000, right? So in this case, 1019. I can change this. You know, I can make it 3520 or whatever. It doesn't matter. Once you create the user and you have that check mark there for sending credentials, they get an email. 
as an admin, you can always go here. You can change their credentials at any time. So you can just reuse a user if someone leaves the company, for example. Or they, you know, someone gets married, they change their name, whatever. Uh, voicemail. Oh, so when a user is created, they have a voicemail box automatically created for them, and it's tied to that user. This is that PIN number for that. If your user has a VoIP phone, they can actually just call in on their own and create their own PIN. You don't have to do anything. If they're using cell phones, then you're going to need to create a, a PIN number for them. Uh, so that way they can then call in from their cell phone and then record their greeting there. Uh, send emails to an alternate address. So this is in addition to this email address up here. Right, so like I want to send it to Bob's, Bob's personal email address, I can do so. Right, including the company directory. Again, I can turn that off or on. Over here on the right, uh, so Bob is listed as a user. And again, I don't know why the drop, drop downs don't always work on this particular browser. But um, you also have the option, option to make him an admin, which gives him a little blue suit icon. The main ca caveat here is if you've just signed up, you only have the one user, uh, make sure you don't accidentally change yourself to a user and log out because uh, then you, there won't be an admin on your account. This is your default time zone. Then you got your default language. Uh, your choices are English, French, or Russian. Uh, ringing timeout. So we can't tell your devices how many times to ring, right? We can't say, I want my desk phone to ring four times. We don't control that. What we do control is how much time we try to reach that device, right? So by default, uh, the ringing timeout here is 20 seconds. That's typically enough time to get to a, uh, a VoIP phone that's connected you know, via Ethernet uh, or a landline. However, if you're sending calls like, to Bob here and he's only going to be using a cell phone, then I would want to change this to 30 or 45 seconds. Uh, and that's simply because it takes longer to route a call to a cell phone than it does to a phone at a fixed location, right? Fixed location. Uh, your phone carriers know exactly where that phone is, so they can just send a call directly to it. Your mobile phone, you could be mobile, which means, hey, we have to, their, your carrier has to bounce calls off of several different cell towers to find you and get the call to you. That takes time. Now, when you're receiving the call, you don't really notice it, right? Your phone just rings, you pick up, you answer. In terms of the PBX system, it does notice it, right, because it has a, a time limit to how long it's going to route a call. So sometimes... Actually, most of the time, 20 seconds is usually enough for most cell phones. But if you're in a heavily, you know, there's heavy call volume or you have weak signal, that may not be enough. That's why we say 30 to 45 seconds. Uh, this main extension number, this is basically your default. This is what your, your voicemail box is associated with as well. Users can have multiple extensions. You can just... Add another extension number there if you want to. Uh, users can also have their own phone number. So this phone number goes straight to Bob, right? The phone number, they, if I give, if Bob gives this phone number out, anyone who calls them on this number, they don't have to go through the virtual reception, right? They're going whoop, straight to Bob. Bob answers. Typically something most like salespeople like. Then you've got your devices. So you can add from spare devices, meaning you already have devices on the account and you're just moving them to Bob. So like Bob is reusing Mary's phone because Mary's no longer here. Right. Or you can add a new device. So we'll start here with SIP phone. SIP is a type of VoIP phone. Right? So VoIP just stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol, i.e. use the internet to make and receive calls. Now, there are several different types of VoIP phones on the market. Uh, and the type that Virtual PBX makes use of is called SIP, right? Sierra Indigo Papa, or like a sip of water. And then we support these various manufacturers, although I don't know why this one isn't showing up. And then if you click on a particular manufacturer, you've got several models of phone, so you find your model. And then at the bottom of the page, which unfortunately is cut off, um, you'll enter a, the name for the device, so Bob's phone typically a good name, uh, and then you enter the MAC address of the phone. So the MAC address, usually it's a sticker on the back, 
that's a unique identifier for each phone. Now, as far as uh, once you click on Create Device, right, this window will close out. As far as your interactions on Dash is concerned, you're done, right? The phone is ready to go. However, on the phone itself, you'll need to log into the phone's web UI uh, and make an update typically to it's one line, maybe to basically you're putting in a URL saying, hey, go to this URL. So then your phone will hopefully reboot or you'll need to reboot it, get it connected to the Internet. It's going to go to that URL. At that URL, it'll say, oh, you have this MAG address. Great, I know what you are. I'm going to send you a config file. Your phone will then reboot again, and then your phone should be working and be a registered VoIP phone on the account. All right, cell phone and landline are the same. Basically, you put a name, you put a number. After you click uh, and then create device, and then you have these are your advanced options. So when Dash sends a call to a cell phone or a landline, right, your your phone will ring. You pick up. You're going to hear right off the bat, this is a forwarded call. Press 1. So by pressing 1, you're letting the system know, yes, you're there, ready to take the call. And then it sends a call to you. Now, maybe that's not ideal. Maybe you don't want to have to bother picking up one. Maybe what you're actually doing is sending this, this user to go for, to send calls to an automated answering service, right? So like it's your after hours answering service, you just want to set up as a phone number. So in that instance where you, a, you don't want to have to press one or you're sending it to an automated answering service which could, that can't press one, you want to put a check mark here on this first option which is a, allow use of cell phone's voicemail. So what that does, call goes to the device. You pick up. We hear that pickup signal. We connect the call. And everything's good to go. All right. Next, you have the keep original caller ID. What that means is on your phone's display, you'll see their phone number show up on your cell phone. Now, if I uncheck it, Instead of their phone number, what I'll see is the, your main number or whatever phone number they called into the system, right? So if this is on Bob, if they called Bob's personal phone number, that 725 phone number, that's the caller ID that shows up on Bob's cell phone. So that lets Bob know, oh, this is a work call. I can take this, right, versus some random telemarketer calling his cell phone. All right, soft phone. So you should read a little warning message here, but basically it's saying, hey, make sure your 911 is set up properly. And it defaults to setting up a third-party soft phone, right? So you're using a CounterPass, uh, or the company CounterPass has a product called Xlight. It's a free soft phone. Right? You're like, oh, I want to use that. I just want to test it out. I want to see what it's like to use a soft phone. So you would give it a name. And then you'd use a SIP username, the SIP password, which if you click on it, it reveals the password, and then the Realm to program that third-party soft phone, x in this case. You would also use this for a VoIP phone that didn't show up under that SIP phone, SIP phone listing for the various manufacturers. Like if you can't find your particular phone, you would use this as well to program that phone. Now, if you want to use the virtual PVX's soft phone application, what you would do is you would click right down here, give it a device name, and then click on Create Device. So once you click on Create Device, Bob here would get an email saying, hey, you have a new soft phone. Here's your login information. At that point, Bob can go on his phone and download the VPBX phone app and then use that login credential to log into a soft phone. We do have a desktop version of the soft phone for uh, Windows and Mac OS. However, that has a licensing fee, which is at $39.99. Uh, you can purchase that actually through the web store. And then you can say, hey, this is for so-and-so, and then we can get that set up for you. Web phone. So web phone is another type of soft phone, or web phone. Uh, you want to set it up specifically on a user. So you don't want to do it under devices. We'll get to that a little bit later. And basically, you give it a name. You click Create Device. So web phone, what that does is allows you to make and receive calls 
on your browser, specifically on uh, Chrome and Firefox currently. And it uses the same login information as your Dash login, right? So your email address, your password that you use for Dash, and your account realm. And uh, it's like, I forget, it's webphone.virtualpbx.net, I believe is the URL. But you'll have, once you have it added on, if you log back in, you'll have that link right here to the web phone. So basically, on your computer, you just need headset and mic, and the browser open, and you can make and receive calls. Now, again, that needs to be specific to the user because it's using your user login information to get to the web phone itself. And we have a covered landline. All right, so let's go over to features. All right, call ID number. So this is for any user that has their own phone number. If they have it, you can enable it. And then what it is is like saying, hey, this phone number, that's going to show up as their caller ID whenever they make an outbound call from their VoIP phones, right? If I don't have this enabled or they don't have their own phone number, it's going to use your main number. All right, call forwarding. This is, again, a VoIP phone feature. Uh, off, on, or failover. So off obviously means not, you're not forwarding calls. On means I'm going to forward it because I know I'm not going to be by my desk phone. So I'm going to enable it, say, hey, forward calls to my mobile phone, put my mobile phone number, and click on Save Changes. So basically saying, hey, I'm going to be mobile today, right? I'm going to be at uh, customer sites. Still want to be able to take some calls on my cell phone, so just forward the calls that are coming to my user to my cell phone. Now, failover mode, which is what this is on, is basically saying, hey, if my desk VoIP phone or any of my VoIP phones lose connection, send calls to my cell phone automatically, right? So the system can, will detect when a VoIP phone is unregistered, right? On that dashboard page, had the, the total devices and it said number unregistered. So it knows, hey, VoIP phone unregistered, calls to Bob, or in this case myself, send it to this phone number instead. Hot desking is another VoIP phone feature. This is in an instance where you have a shared office environment where people will be changing desks from day to day. All right. So on Monday, I sat at desk 7. Today is Tuesday. I'm sitting at desk 23. Both desks have their own VoIP phone. So what I can do is pick up the phone. I can use a feature code, which is star 11, and that's to get to – or that's to enable hot desking. Then it's going to ask me for my hot desk ID. So obviously I would need to put in a numeric code here. I normally just say put your extension number here. Uh, and then hot desking is enabled, meaning calls that are coming in to my user will get directed to the phone that I'm sitting at so that I can pick up answer calls. End of my day, pick up the VoIP phone. I hit star one, two. It turns off hot desking. I go, go home. Next day I come in, I'm at a separate desk. Again, pick up star one, one. Calls are coming to meet the desk that I'm sitting at. Voicemail. Again, every user has a voicemail box. You do not want to delete that voicemail box uh, unless you're absolutely sure that person is, you don't want the person to ever have voicemail. All right, users can have their own fax box. Typically, if you enable it, I recommend making use of a phone number to have it go directly to the fax box. Um, I am old enough, or I always guess the fax machines that I used at a younger age were such that I entered the number, I hit start fax, I sent the document through, I walk away and get back to whatever I'm doing, and maybe half hour, hour later, I check to make sure the fax actually went through. And, you know, that's the way I, I'm wired in terms of my faxing. And by putting a number here, that's what you're doing, right? You're letting someone just enter a fax number, hit send fax, documents on the way, they go about their day. If you choose to say, hey, I'm going to sign an extension here, what happens is the person faxing calls your main number, right? They hear your main greeting. Then they enter the extension number. Then they have to hit start fax to send the fax through. Some people are fine because they don't get that many faxes and the people they deal with that care how to do it other people that might be an issue.
Follow Me. So Follow Me comes into play uh, if you have multiple devices. So by default, the first time you look at Follow Me, it's going to look like this. Right? Your devices are set up to do not ring because it doesn't know how you want it set. So for the devices that you want to make use of, you uncheck. And then you can do something like this, distribute. So bring the first device for a set amount of time, then bring the second device. Notice up here, this is the ringing timeout for this setup. Now, once you enable Follow Me, this disables that ringing timeout on your user, right, which is default at 20 seconds. It's saying, hey, this supersedes that because this has got more devices. You probably need more than 20 seconds. Now you can change the order around by clicking and dragging. You can toggle these as much as you want, and in fact you can also do something like this so both phones are ringing for the full time. Right, music on hold. Users can have their own hold music. You click enable, again, upload. Dot wave, dot mp3, recorded in mono, one megabyte in size. A one megabyte mp3, by the way, is roughly five minutes. All right. Then you have customized call recording. So you don't have to make use of call recording. You can set these all to off and you're not recording calls. But if you want to, this allows you to do it on a per user basis. So inbound internal basically means Someone on my account is calling me, right? So another user on the account, right? Inbound external means customers calling me, right? Whereas, uh, what's it? Outbound internal means I'm calling another user, so I'm calling Bob. And then outbound external means I'm calling a customer. Right now, the only format supported is MP3, and then these are all stored on AWS. All right, groups. So these are departments. Uh, and it has a fairly straightforward or some fairly simple routing options. So you click up here and add a group to create a new group. You give it a name, and then you click and drag people over to be a part of it. And you also give it an extension number. Right? The extension number is so that way your staff members can easily transfer calls. Uh, or you can give it as part of your main grid. Hey, enter this session to speak to a salesperson, for example. However, typically in that particular scenario, I said just give it a menu option to go to the ring group versus telling them an extension number. All right, so if you click on a group name after it's created, you can always change the name. Uh, dialing repeats, this is the number of times an uh, inbound caller can go through the ring group, right? So how many times it can ring each person. You got these little arrows here to the right that you can adjust that up or down. Members, so let's just see the numbers, and then this is how your call, how, how, how the group is handling calls to the members. Right, so up here at the top right, again, you've got your ring, total ring time. So this is two minutes in this group. I can click distribute and have it go in order to each of these people. I can adjust the order, and then redistribute if I want to. I can adjust these bars as much as I want. And so typically the most common one are is, is, is like how I started off as is this. So this is industry-wise it's referred to as blast ringing. Basically you're ringing everybody at the same time for the same amount of time. Uh, or the next most common is, hey, I'm just going to bring these people in order. Now, one thing about ring groups is, say, here, Duke is on a call, and a second call comes in, he's going to hear a call waiting beep until a call rolls to the next person, and they pick up. So in the, in the scenario where there's blast ringing, right, he's always going to hear a call, or that call waiting beep while he's on a call, and he's got to hope one of these other people picks up quickly. So he doesn't get as annoyed by that call waiting. And then you can always remove a user at any time. 
extension. Again, you can have multiple extensions go to the same ring group. You can have a phone number go to a specific ring group. So like, hey, for sales, just call this number. Boom, goes right to your salespeople. And then you've got group features. All right, first up, call recording. It's either on or it's off. Basically, you're recording all calls that come into the group. Ring back. This is essentially hold music for your ring group. Uh, the main thing is the file length you want to make sure is uh, at least as long as your ring duration that you set up. So let's go back here for a second, two members. So you can adjust this, so I can put this to 200, for example. sure why it's not letting me adjust that, but you can adjust it. Um, but then when you have ring back, you want to make sure that your your file lasts as long as your ring back or as your ring duration, excuse me. Again, dot .wave, dot .mp3, recorded in mono, one megabyte size. Next action. So if no one picks up, what do you want the system to do with the call? All right, so two ring throughs on this particular group. After that second ring through, no one was able to pick up for whatever reasons. I'm actually sending them to a voicemail box. Okay, I'm not sure why someone's calling me. Or more importantly, why it's still ringing. Sorry about that. All right, allow call forward. Uh, again, this is for your VoIP phone users. So if you enable this, your VoIP phone user, yeah, your VoIP phone users, pardon me, can choose to make use of call forwarding and have calls go to the cell phones, right? So if you don't allow this, that means they can only pick up from their VoIP devices Meaning if, say, I went out of the office because I'm at a customer site, even if I have call forwarding set up on my user, calls from the group aren't going to go to my, my cell phone. And then caller ID prepend. Again, this is uh, a VoIP phone device or feature. And what this allows you to do is give additional text or numbers in front of the caller ID information that shows up on their VoIP phones. So that way you're giving your staff a heads up about what, what the call's about. So if you have people in multiple ring groups, you can put a little bit of text ahead of time. Oh, it's about a billing issue versus a sales issue versus customer service issue. Or it's about, you know, doohickey A versus doohickey B. All right, next up we've got devices. Shows all the devices on your account. Red means not connected i.e. not registered, green means it's good, usually it's a cell phone, or it's a device that's actually on a live account that's working. If you ever see one black, that means you put a click disabled on the side over here. And then you see the name and who it's associated with. You get an icon here to look at different settings, uh, which again mostly comes into play for the cell phone or landlines, where you can do those check marks. You can add devices here. Again, you got the same options. Uh, you do not want to add the web phone or the virtual PBX soft phones here, just because those need to be associated with a specific user. Uh, and especially for the soft phone, because then they won't have their login information. Uh, generally speaking, uh, on the devices page, if you're adding devices here, at least what I've come across among customers is it's they're opening a new location the IT guy is just adding phones. And that way when people actually get there at their desks, then the uh, admin can come back in and assign the phones to the specific user once they know who those people are. All right, voicemail boxes. These are all the voicemail boxes on the account. You can add a, or create a, your own voicemail boxes here. 
you only really need to do that if you want like a standalone voicemail box or you're giving a voicemail box specific to a ring group or a queue, right? Because your actual users have their own voicemail box already associated with them and created. Now, if I deleted, say, Ray's voicemail box and I try to recreate one through clicking Add to Voicemail Box, it's not going to be, uh, I can't assign it to him. Like, it won't have this option to put a user to it. And the only way for Ray to have a voicemail box intrinsically tied to his user again is to delete his user and recreate it. For some reason, feature codes is not working on my page. But the feature codes, uh, so you can normally access them through your when you're logged in as an admin, but they're also published on our website, so any of your staff can get them at any time or like print them out. Uh, and then we got call logs. Call logs show your call activity on your account. You can click on them to get some more information to say, hey, who did it ring to and what devices. Normally, you want to see normal clearing next to an entry. Basically, that means the call ended normally. Nothing unusual happened. If you see lose race, that indicates that this call went to either a group of phones or a ring group. And so this particular device didn't pick up, whereas this one did. And then you can download these as well. Our engineers are working on some advanced reporting based off of the call logs. I, I unfortunately do not know when that is going to go live. Pretty sure our marketing team will announce that once it is. All right, so over here on the far right, in the top right, got the three horizontal line icon for your menu. So we're on the dashboard right now. Next up, what we have is queues, right? So this is for call queues or ACD queues. Uh, these are basically like a ring group, except they have more routing options. So you can click up here to add a new queue, and then you'll get to the settings for the queue. You give it a name. You can give it an extension or a phone number, right? So a phone number that goes directly to it. Uh, and then you've got a call routing strategy. This one is set to most idle. So that means whoever's been waiting for a call the longest is the person who will get a call next. Uh, there is round robin, which is basically random. It evens out over time. Uh, there is least offered, meaning whoever's been offered the least amount of calls will get the next call in, right? So Bob's had five calls offered to him. Mary's had 20 calls offered to her. Bob's getting the next call that comes in, right? And then there's least calls, meaning least amount of connected calls. So Bob has spoken to all five of the people that are offered to him, but Mary's only spoken to two. Next call that comes in is going to go to Mary. All right, hold treatment. Again, you can upload music, right? Dot wave, dot MP3, mono, one megabyte. The queue timeout. This is how much time your people call your customers can wait on hold. The call limit. You can limit the number of people who can wait on hold. Uh, zero means there's no limit. Now, if you have no staff members logged in, then you can have this enabled. So timeout immediately if empty. Basically means I have no agents logged in. Don't make people wait for 3,600 seconds. Instead, do my escalation things. So if I have an escalation queue, that means I send it to a second queue for additional staff to pick up. Or if I have none, right, so I only have the one queue, for example, then I can say, oh, okay, send it to this voicemail box. Likewise, if it's empty, and say, okay, time out, then I'm sending them straight to voicemail. Agent behavior section, uh, agent recovery time in seconds. Basically, after Bob has spoken to a customer, the system will not offer him a call from the queue for 30 seconds or any other ACD queue that, or uh, call queue he might be in. He's got 30 seconds of you know, catching his breath, getting a drink of water, updating his notes, whatever. Okay, force away on rejected or missed. So if an agent, a staff member, misses a call from the queue, the system will put them in, put them in away mode, 
they themselves have to put them back in ready mode to be able to take calls again. And then Agent Connect timeout, basically how much time are we trying to reach that person or that your staff member before it moves on to the next person. And so right now when agents can log in and then this is how they would mark themselves as ready. Mark this is a way like when they go to lunch, for example, and then log out at the end of their shift. This is the queue monitor so you can see who's logged in and who's getting calls, et cetera. Blacklists. So this is only uh, – blacklist is something only admins can get to. Uh, basically, it allows you to block calls from certain phone numbers from reaching your system. So uh, you click on Edit Blacklists. You'd either add to create a new list or you would click on an existing list. And then you add a phone number. Put plus one area code and phone number. And then you would click on Save. You go back to Settings. And then you have your available lists and your selected lists. So, so selected lists means the ones that are actively in use. right? So right now I don't have a blacklist in use at this time. But instead, I can just move this over and click Update. And now this is my active blacklist. All right, as an admin, you can get to any fax box on the account and see what's going on. You can also get to the email to fax logs to see why a particular fax didn't get sent out. Recorder. You can also go to the user portal. So this is any user. So every user will have access to the queues if you're making use of queues and the user portal. So they can check their voicemail. Now, on your voicemail box, you have the option to delete after notification. Uh, so if you have that enabled, then there will be no voicemails here, as is in this case. But you can see your call history. You can see the faxes, the contact list. This is basically every uh, extension on the account, so ring groups, users, etc. If you're making use of conferencing, you have this option. So you can invite other users on the account to your conference. You can lock a conference. You can mute everybody. You can unmute everybody. You can end the conference. Also, when you have participants, you have the option to mute a particular participant or kick a particular participant. Uh, but the other thing that users would make use of is right here under settings and devices. This is where they can make use or enable their call forwarding themselves. So they don't have to bother an admin for that and then put in the correct phone number. And then you have access to voicemails because you're an admin. You can get to any voicemail box on the system and see what messages they have. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about voicemail boxes, they can hold up to 100 messages. And after that, they're full, and then you need to either delete them or not get voicemails on that particular voicemail box, which is one of the reasons to make use of the delete after notification. Uh, and then one other heading here is the webhooks. This lets you make use of APIs to link Dash into other software uh, and have, I guess, greater synergy. And that is everything I have. Uh, I'll hang out for a minute or two in case people have questions. They can uh, say something in the chat window here. But other than that, I thank you for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful day.
All right, not seeing any questions come up, so I'm going to go ahead and end the stream. Again, I thank you for your time, and have a wonderful day.